welcome everybody to this uh, 18th edition of uh, author tv webinar and i welcome you uh, today to this uh, special edition of orthopedic oncology and we have uh, dr ashish gulia with us who will speak to us on uh, evaluation of bone tumors what you need to know in your opd in general practice uh, dr gulia is uh, associate professor at uh, famous tata memorial hospital and uh, we are glad to have you sir on author tv welcome and over to you thank you so much ashok and uh, uh, sir your voice is a bit low if you can okay so thank you so much ashok for uh, giving us the platform to spread the knowledge about one of the rare fields of orthopedic and orthopedic oncology and uh, uh, i would like to thank you for this platform because this is indeed a very nice way to reach more and more people and uh, at their comfort level so i get your greetings from the famous tata memorial hospital where i work in and also from one of the most initiative uh, initiated societies that is indian musculoskeletal oncology society of india So, as uh, Dr. Ashok told you that today we're going to speak on, or we're going to interact on evaluation of a suspected bone tumor, and I thought this is a very nice way to start with because then we can, from here, we can build up upon on a series of all uh, orthopedic oncology where we can discuss more diverse topics. But this topic is uh, the first basic topic to start with. on to which we can build upon and as the title suggests that we will evaluate a lesion how it comes into your clinic or a hospital and then how you diagnose it correctly starting with some basics uh, the exact cause of bone tumors is not known uh, what is known is that they arise in the bones which are growing very rapidly that's why you see most of the tumors happening in do Uh, first and the second uh, decades of life in the later part of the life you see more of bony metastasis and that's what needs to be kept in mind there are some theories which have been postulated but nothing is proved as such some people postulated that genetic mutations leads to uh, these bone tumors but the uh, the percentage of the tumors which uh, which occur because of genetic mutations is extremely extremely small exposure to the radiation have also known been uh, has also been known to uh, a reason for the occurrence of this tumor but again this is just a hypothesis which is not really proved unless until you have received a high dose of radiation because of a treatment of a known cancer or if it is because of accidental exposure to the nuclear material uh, other etiologies like viral and trauma are just postulated and not been supported nicely what we need to understand is as orthopedic surgeons and as other physicians that the incidence of bone tumors as compared to all cancer is very very less and that's the reason that there is not much awareness about these tumors and people don't know whom to approach and what time to approach and that's the reason that we have lack of knowledge about these tumors but we need to be very attentive because bone tumors if detected at the right time and treated in the right way has very good outcome we see uh, basically benign tumors and malignant tumors the most common benign tumors what the orthopedic surgeon will will see in the clinic will be giant cell tumors fibrous dysplasias unicameral bone cysts eosinophilic granulomas osteochondromas and osteoid osteomas and non osseous fibromas so these are some of the tumors which you will see in your clinic which are benign if we talk about malignant then there are three main tumors that is osteosarcoma ewing sarcoma and chondrosarcoma which are the main tumors which are seen as uh, the primary sarcomas of the bone and that's what i have enumerated here these are the lesions which are benign and the malignant lesions which are most common a lot of time this is asked that why it is so essential that we need a very systematic approach in the treatment of bone tumors 
we know that all patients with any disorders require a good diagnosis but it is it becomes very very important in 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 terms of tumors because broadly we need to differentiate a benign tumor from malignant tumor and a specific reason is that if you try to treat a benign tumor by the treatment guidelines of a malignant tumor you will be causing disasters and similarly if you try to treat a malignant tumor by the ways you will treat a benign tumor again you will end up in a disaster and this disaster is not just for the patients but nowadays you are seeing a lot of medical legal issues happening and this can actually ruin somebody's career as well that's why it is extremely important that we have a systematic approach we we diagnose these tumors uh, very correctly because then henceforth the treatment will depend upon the correct diagnosis now this is a small algorithm which i have created here which can help you to reach a correct diagnosis whenever you get a lesion in the bone which is symptomatic and the patient sees you first of all you need to try to differentiate broadly into whether this tumor is actually a, a, whether, whether this lesion is actually a tumor or you are dealing with something else and something else can be infections metabolic bond disorders or developmental disorders okay once you have ruled them out and you feel that this neoplastic etiology then you try to differentiate them into malignant and benign and this broad classification is of extreme importance if you feel it's a benign tumor then these benign tumors can be of three types these can be latent lesions which do not grow and usually are found as an incidental finding when x rays are done for something else then you and a typical example of this is non ossifying fibroma when you talk about active lesions these are slow growing lesions but these lesions do grow and once they grow to a optimum uh, size they can compromise with the integrity of the bone and can cause symptoms and these lesions can be typical example is a simple bone cyst or a unicameral bone cyst aggressive benign lesions grow very rapidly and they may behave and they may they may have clinical features like malignant bone tumors and the typical example is giant cell tumor of bone when we talk about malignant tumors you again need to differentiate them whether a tumor is primarily arising in the bone that is it is de novo starting in the bone that means it is a primary sarcoma of the bone or this tumor has started from somewhere else that is some other organ in the body and then has metastasized to the bone and these are called as secondaries in the bone and as i have done here the management of each differential is different and that's why it is of extreme importance that we reach to a correct diagnosis so that we can treat these patients properly so we do all this uh, staging and we do all this diagnosis and this uh, evaluation with some specific aims and we always try to detect these tumors early because we know that if detected early they have good outcomes obviously as i've stated in the last couple of slides that you need to reach a correct diagnosis because if you do not have a correct diagnosis your treatment cannot be correct you need to have appropriate optimal staging what does this mean now the malignant bone tumors they may spread in the body and hence the staging may change the way you treat this patient a localized osteosarcoma of the distal femur will be treated by a curative intent by surgical resection and limb salvage while while a disseminated disease will be treated with just best supportive care that's why you need to have optimum staging bone tumors cannot be treated alone with surgery you need a team you need your medical oncologist and you need your radical on uh, radiation oncologist so that you can provide complete treatment now this multi modal treatment has to be provided in the correct sequence and that's why we always say the right treatment in the right sequence if it is provided that's one of the aims of our correct uh, approach now coming to the diagnosis i have always been saying that there are three pillars which with which actually holds a correct diagnosis and these three pillars are history and clinical findings the radiological picture that is the imaging which gives you the radiological diagnosis and this clinical radiological diagnosis which you have made has to be proved or substantiated by 
doing a biopsy which gives you a histology. So your diagnosis will stand on these three pillars and please remember if any of this is missing you may end up in a wrong situation or an incorrect diagnosis. Hence we should consider all these three uh, things very uh, uh, appropriately and should have contributions from all these things rather than just relying on one of them. So we'll take them one by one. Let's first talk about history and examination. Patient's age, its location in the bone and the history are the three main things which you need to consider in a patient when you are doing clinical evaluation. This table actually shows you which are the common benign and malignant tumors which occur in that age group. As, we, as I told you earlier, the first two decades where bones are growing rapidly, you will have most of the tumors, most of the primary bone tumors occurring in this age group, whether they are benign or malignant, and this table enumerates the same. As we grow older, the primary bone tumors, the incidence decreases. But giant cell tumors and chondrosarcomas occur in mature skeleton. Chondrosarcomas often a bit more late. And as uh, we grow further older, the main tumors which we see in the bone are the secondaries or the metastasis from other primary organs. This is a very common picture which we see in most of the books. And this, this talks about the various tumors occurring in various locations. Typically to say that giant cell tumors and ABCs will be in the epiphysis, osteosarcomas in the metaphysis, and <clears throat> Even sarcomas in the diaphysis. But what we should remember that these are the most common location, but this is not detectable. We do see lots of osteosarcomas happening in diaphysis of the bone, and we see lots of even sarcomas happening in the metaphysis as well. So, the, though it gives you the most correct location in terms of high, highest number of incidence, but you can have different locations as well. Coming to symptomatology. Bone tumors basically will have two main symptoms as far as the local disease is concerned. First is pain and when you are evaluating the pain, you need to understand the nature of the pain. Whether it is pain because of the lysis of the bone or the pain is because of the stretching of the adjacent structures like neurovascular bundle. The pain in the tumor generally doesn't subside and it keeps increasing. Second is swelling. Again, you need to understand that what sort of swelling patient is having, whether it's a bony swelling or a soft tissue swelling, whether the patient has uh, one swelling or multiple swellings, what is the rate of growth of this swelling, how it is progressing, and how it, and how it can correlate and give you a, a hint towards the, the diagnosis. Typically talking about, if it's a benign tumor, which is slow growing, you will have a long history and it, it, it depends upon which sort of benign tumor is whether active or aggressive tumor. Or while malignant tumors always grow very rapidly and will have rapid progression. Very important point to note here is that uh, swelling which regresses is extremely unlikely to be a tumor swelling because tumors do not regress unless and until some treatment is given. So that's a nice point to note and can be helpful. Tumors can also cause deformity and obviously if the, the, the integrity of the bone is compromised, the patient may not be able to walk or be weight on that leg. Another important point is to understand that malignant bone tumors can metastasize to the other parts of the body and the most common is, most common is, uh, uh, most common is uh, pulmonary uh, metastasis. So, pulmonary metastasis will cause respiratory distress and this can be a feature which you need to evaluate in, in your patient before you start on doing any investigations and uh, uh, other, other biopsies. General physical health again will also tell you about the cataxic state or the stage of the disease which you can evaluate with clinical examination. When we come to clinical evaluation per se, Whenever you see this swelling, when you examine the patient locally, you need to know the following points. You need to understand the size and the location of the swelling. You need to see how many compartments this swelling is involved. 
If the swelling involves multiple compartments, it may not be possible to save the limb. You need to understand about the previous treatment as well. Whether this patient has undergone any previous surgery, whether there are previous scars and the drains. Now, it is always known that these scars of the previous surgeries known to harbor the tumor cells. Hence, you will have to plan to excise all of them if you are doing a surgery again on this patient. You may do spread to the uh, nearest uh, eclon of lymph node and these regions as well needs to be examined and carefully looked for any metastasis in the lymph nodes. Last but not the least, you also need to understand that you need to evaluate the neurovascular structures because these, the involvement of these structures may convert uh, surgery from limb service to amputation. Once you analyze all these factors, then you try to categorize whether you can salvage this limb by doing limb salvage or you will have to do amputation to remove this disease. There are some set of hematological investigations which has helped us in diagnosing some of these bone tumors. Uh, complete blood count is done to have uh, overall evaluation of the patients. Uh, coagulation profile will definitely be required before doing a biopsy. We also assess the renal function and kidney function test as well. When we particularly talk about tumor markers, in primary bone tumors, the value of tumor markers is very less. Though alkaline phosphatase in osteosarcoma and LDH in eating sarcoma is known to have some prognostic, uh, prognostic, uh, uh, prognostication evaluation uh, uh, efficacy, but these are not known to change the clinical management, hence their role is pretty limited. The more importance comes when we are dealing with secondaries in the bone or lesions in the bone which are caused by myeloma. Prostatic specific antigen are very specific for prostate cancer and we can diagnose bony metastasis which are caused by prostate cancer by just doing this simple investigation. Any GI malignancies or lung malignancies or uh, upper digestive tract malignancies will have raised CEA and C125 level and hence can tell you about the malignancies in these areas. Myeloma have a very set profile and more than 50% of myelomas can be diagnosed by doing these blood investigations, which is serum electrophoresis and urinary Van Jones protein. So these have more value in terms of diagnosing myeloma and secondaries in the bone. Now, this was the part about the history and the general clinical examination. Now we we'll move on to the second part, which is imaging. This imaging is the second pillar to uh, establish a correct diagnosis. When we talk about imaging, imaging provides us three important things. Number one, it helps in diagnosing the disease correctly. Number two, it tells you about the local extent of the disease, which will eventually help you to ascertain whether you can do limb service surgery or not. And third is, because malignant tumors and some of the aggressive benign tumors do spread to the other part of the body, imaging will tell you about the distance spread as well. And these are the investigations which are enumerated, which you can see in the right upper corner, which can help you to diagnose locally extent and see the distance spread of bone tumors. When we talk about local imaging, the plane radiograph is the gold standard and is the first investigation of what we do. What is important is to do these x-rays in two perpendicular planes and you must scan the full bone. And the reason for this is that T3 lesions, that the lesions, the malignant lesions may have skip lesions in the bone which is not involved directly by the primary bone tumors. So if you don't scan the full bone, you may miss that part and that may be not included in your resection, hence you will leave the disease behind. The by far best possible investigation to evaluate the disease locally in bone tumors or soft tissue sarcomas is MRI. We need to do all the sequences. If preferred, we need to do a contrast and hence uh, imaging. And again, like I uh, told you in the radiograph, we need to scan the full bone 
in order to evaluate whether if this patient is having any skip lesions in the same pole. To look for the distance metastasis, we have various investigations available. First is chest radiograph. It is not very sensitive, but it can show bigger lesions. The gold standard today is non-contrast thin slice CT scan. You don't have to add contrast if you are just looking at metastasis from bone and soft tissue sarcomas. When we particularly talk about bone malignant tumors, they do metastasize to other bones as well. Hence, we need to add a bone scan to do that. PET scan is a new modality which everybody talks about and everybody wants to do PET scan to diagnose and evaluate every lesion. But unluckily, the, the, role, the role of PET scan in bone tumors is not very well defined. And there are very less added advantages of doing such an extensive investigation. You may not add a lot of additional information in addition to doing a CT scan or bone scan if you are adding a PET scan and hence its use should be uh, very judiciously categorized and thought before doing these investigations. When we talk about imaging, the plain radiographs as I told you are gold standard to start with in the first investigations. And these can give you a lot of clues about diagnosing these tumors correctly. Now, I will enumerate here four points which you need to assess, which you need to look for in any X-ray with suspected bone tumor, which can help you to reach correct diagnosis. And the first one is what type of lesion you are seeing. Lesions can be categorized into lighting, sclerotic or mixed lesions. To give you some examples, a giant cell tumor will have a lytic appearance. A osteosarcoma will have a sclerotic appearance because it is thrown out of bone. And chondroid lesions and even osteosarcomas can have mixed type of lesions seen. Second very important thing is zone of transition. Zone of transition is a zone where normal bone meets the abnormal bone. It can be well defined or not. What does well-defined mean? We need to understand this a bit and I'll spend a minute here. When a tumor grows slowly, it is giving a lot of chance to the bone to throw normal bone at the periphery and this normal immunity of body is trying to restrict this pathology. And when tumors are slow growing, it gives bone a chance to throw more bone at the periphery and hence you get a nice thick sclerotic line which demarcates the abnormal bone from a normal bone and these type of demarcations are considered as well-defined zone of transition or narrow zone of transition. Narrow zone of transition depicts a benign pathology but if tumor is very aggressive it is not giving any chance to the body's immunity or to the bone to restrict this pathology the zone of transition is wide and hence we cannot point out this transition zone as you can see in this x-ray that it is blurred and you cannot make out where the disease is starting and ending. Such zone of transitions are wide and they always tell us that you are dealing with an aggressive pathology. This can be a malignant bone tumor or it can be an aggressive benign bone tumor. Third very important point is periosteal reaction. Periosteal reaction can be benign or malignant. Here per se, I am not talking about codman triangle or, or some gray appearance. I am just asking you to differentiate between a benign buttress type of periosteal reaction. Again, the same reason, slow growing tumor, giving a lot of chance for bone to throw more bone there to restrict the growth of this pathology and shows a buttress type of periosteal reaction. Why a malignant tumor will not give a chance and you will have different sort of malignant periosteal reactions like hair on end, quadment triangle and other type of aggressive reactions. Fourth point is the matrix. So what is matrix? Matrix is the, the component of the tumor which is produced by the tumor cells. Now, chondroid lesions or the cartilage produced producing lesions will have a chondroid matrix and the typical examples in benign are enchondromas 
and chondrosarcomas as malignant chondroid lesions. Osteosarcomas are malignant bone tumors which produce a lot of osteoid matrix and that's how they look sclerotic as well. I spoke about MRI as the best investigation or the investigation of choice for local staging. And the reasons are it tells you the exact extent of the disease. It gives you relationship of disease to the vital structures, that is the neurovascular bundle, the fissure and the joint. It tells you the joint involvement. It can also tell you about the skip metastasis. And hence, to evaluate a bone tumor locally, we always do MRI except for some uh, exceptions. Like for example, if you want to see uh, nidus in osteoma, osteoma, you may prefer a very thin slice CT scan as compared to MRI. If you are dealing with these small lesions in the uh, posterior spine column, you may prefer to do a CT scan. Otherwise, MRI by far is the best investigation to evaluate these lesions locally. <clears throat> Now I'll talk something about imaging which can help you to assess uh, the spread of the disease distantly. As I told you that x-rays and this kind of the chest are taken, but CT scan of chest are both sensitive. Bone scan, again I have discussed with you that in malignant bone tumors you need to do bone scan because they will tell you the distance spread of a disease to other bones as you are seeing in these examples shown in this slide. PET scan, again limited value but the enemy here is if you are trying to stage an even sarcoma by doing a, a PET scan you can obviate the need of doing bone marrow biopsies which are done as a part of staging of even sarcoma. Some of the chondroid lesions may be difficult to diagnose on histopathology specifically low grade chondrosarcomas versus enchondromas and this is where PET scan can have some value. Though the role is not very well defined and we have uh, papers which talks about uh, its, its, uh, its, its moderate usability but this can be uh, one help which can help you to solve some issues in, in case of contract lesions but otherwise the role of PET scan is pretty limited. Now this was the second imaging. So till now we, what we have seen is we have Whenever a patient has approached to the clinic, we have done a detailed history and examination and we have reached to a clinical diagnosis. Once we had that clinical diagnosis, we did some blood investigations and after that we did appropriate imaging depending upon what was your clinical diagnosis. And here we reached to a clinical radiological diagnosis. Now this clinical radiological diagnosis cannot be presumed as the final diagnosis and treatment cannot be started. You need to confirm this diagnosis by doing a biopsy which will give you the histopathology and that's where you will reach a correct diagnosis. Just to give you an example, this was one of the cases which was referred to me way back in 2009 and from then I have been using this case to highlight the importance of biopsy. Now if you see this x-ray, this is a lytic lesion which is located in the distal uh, epiphyseal metaphyseal lesion of right femur. There is no periosteal reaction, the lesion is lytic, the zone of transition is narrow and mature skeleton. So 99.9% .9 even the inexperienced hands you will call it as giant side tumor of the bone. But if we go right away we are going to do further imaging, we are going to do biopsy and then we are going to treat this patient. But this patient was treated without any further imaging, without any biopsy, resuming it to be a giant cell tumor, a curatage was done, the bone graft was taken from the EJ crust and it was bone grafted. But what we saw at the end, when this histopathology was sent to us, it was a high grade sarcoma and this patient ultimately ended up in amputation. So this again highlights the importance of having the biopsy before starting any treatment. So this slide I think is the crux of this whole talk. If you just want to take one take home message, this is the message. That biopsy is the most important investigation in work of a skeletal lesion. Irrespective of how typical the imaging looks, irrespective 
whatever the radiological report says, if you want to start any treatment, and by any treatment I mean whether it's surgery or it's chemotherapy or it's radiotherapy, you must do a biopsy and then start with the treatment. Please, please, please do not presume things. Confirm it, do a biopsy and then proceed with the treatment. And as I highlighted, this may not be a disaster just for the patient, but now because of a lot of medical legal issues, doctors are in a lot of problem and hence you should be very, very careful in this. Biopsy itself is a big topic. And uh, uh, after discussing with Dr. Ashok, we formulated a whole plan that we'll be doing this series on oncology and probably the next talk will be on biopsy. And the biopsy talk will talk about all the important things which are enumerated here in this slide and we shall discuss them in detail in our next interaction. What is also very important is that there has to be a correct sequence followed. You just cannot do a biopsy when, patient, when you see a patient first time in your clinic. You need to evaluate a patient properly. You need to complete your history and clinical examination. Based upon the clinical examination, you, you need to do the right imaging and then biopsy should be performed. And this sequence must be followed. There are more than one reason for it. And again, this will again be covered while we talk about biopsy. Now, once we have these three pillars standing, then I think you can solve this jigsaw puzzle of having the correct diagnosis. So all PPCs should match. We should have correlation between the clinical examination, patient's history, which is substantiated, which is supported by the radiology to get a clinical diagnosis, and then which is confirmed by histopathologists, and only then we can proceed further. And that's how we can teach a correct diagnosis. Now, second part of this talk is to talk about staging. Now, staging tells you about the distance spread of the disease. If you are dealing with locally aggressive lesions like giant cell tumor of the bone, maybe a simple chest x-ray is more than enough. If patient is symptomatic in other bones, you may add a bone scan. Otherwise, a plain chest radiograph is enough. If you see any lesions on the chest radiograph, you may have to go on and do a CT scan of the chest. Otherwise, it is not required. When we talk about malignant bone tumors, even sarcoma, as I said, need to be staged by a CT scan of the chest, a bone scan, and bone marrow biopsies from two different areas. If you do not want to do bone marrow biopsies because it's, it's an invasive procedure and you have the PET scan facility available, you can do a PET CT which can complete the investigation as a single stage modality. Osteosarcomas are staged by doing a non contrast CT scan of the chest and a post scan, as I mentioned earlier. So that's the staging. Now, what does this do? The, all these investigations put together tells you about the disease locally and the disease which is spread in the body. And that's how we come to staging. Now, staging in bone tumors is basically talked about by these two systems. And the first and the easier system and the more popular system is anything staging system, which is also called as Musculoskeletal Tumor Society System, which was popular by Professor Anneking in the United States of America. Second system which came later on was AGCC, staging system, which is a bit complicated but more comprehensive. So Anneking basically told us about uh, different uh, staging systems, both for the benign and the malignant. And he said that benign tumors can be latent, active and aggressive, which I have already spoken to you. When we come about the malignant bone tumor, he said that we need to look at three major parameters. Number one, what is the grade of the tumor? Because it is the grade which decides about the aggressiveness of the disease and similarly the Similarly, the spread of the disease. Second part, what he talked about was the local extent of the disease. The larger the tumor, worse may be the prognosis. The larger the tumor, more the chance of disease to spread anywhere else in the body. And third part was the distance spread, that is the metastasis. So this system is very simple, very easy to learn, and very easy to use in your clinical practice. Any low-grade tumor is stage one. 
any high grade tumor is stage 2 and any tumor with distal spread of the disease is stage 3 now stage 1 and 2 is divided into a and b which is again very simple it depends upon the size if the tumor is within the bone or in the same compartment it is 1a if it is extra compartmental 1b and similarly high grade tumors intra compartmental and extra compartmental are divided into 2a and 2b so simple classification used by a lot of people and very easy to practice second system is kjcc system which talks about the primary site the involvement of the regional lymph nodes and the distant spread and the grade of the tumor it's a bit more complex but we will see now as you can see in this picture now there is such a it's, 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 you can also call this as tnm stage or tnmg stage so there are four parameters which you need to look at t is the tumor size n is the regional lymph node involvement m is the metastasis is the different spread uh, distance spread and g is the histopathology now what is very important to understand in this is that any tumor which is less than 8 cm is T1, more than 8 cm is T2 and any tumor with a skip lesion in the same bone is considered as T3 lesion. And the regional lymph node involvement is N1 and then any distance spread can be divided into M1 and B. I'll show you some pictures. So this is lesion which is more than 8 cm so it's T2 lesion skips T3, spread to the lung, it's called as M1A, spread to the other parts of the body, M1B. And that's how you plot this table and this is this table which tells you about which stage this patient is. Now a lot of people talk about doing staging and I have been talking to you since past 10 minutes about staging. Why staging is so important? It is just not oncology. Wherever, whichever disease we look at the staging, the staging tells you very two important things. Number one, what sort of treatment you will give to your patient. And number two, what will be the outcome of this treatment or what will be the outcome of this disease. And more so important oncology, you can understand any patient who comes with a bone tumor will ask you these two questions whether I'm going to survive or not, whether my limb will be salvaged or not, and what sort of treatment you're going to provide me. And all this is going to told to him depending upon what is the staging of this disease and that's how staging is so important. And hence, again stressing that you should not start any treatment before you complete the staging of this patient. Last few slides on some very important features which are different in oncology. Now, as I mentioned earlier as well, the treating bone tumors is not one man game. It is not, uh, it, it, it's, it's not completely a, a surgeon's role. You need a team. <laughs> you need your medical oncologist, remission oncologist to get a correct diagnosis. You need a good pathologist. To have the right imaging done, you need a good radiologist. And that's why MDP as a multidisciplinary team approach is very, very essential. And this is just not me talking out of my head. These are various guidelines talk about. The patients who are treated in hospitals which have MDP have far better outcomes as compared to the patients who are treated in isolated hospitals where a surgeon is sitting in some other hospital and a medical oncologist in some other hospital. The diagnoses are very complex and that's how you need a team to correct them, to, to diagnose them correctly and then, and then the place the right treatment, the right sequence. And these are the NCCM guidelines which talks about that MDP should have a core team and then they should have additional specialists and that's how a good MDP team is formed. And, and this is a chart which talks about you know major bone and soft tissue sarcomas and you will see very clearly that surgery is just one part and you definitely require inputs from the medical oncology friends and the radiation oncology friends if you want to have the optimum outcomes. Now, just ending this session with, uh, uh, with a very interesting and maybe, you know, not so related to the evaluation of bone tumor stuff. A uh, few slides at the end. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity and the platform provided by Dr. Ashok and his team to tell you about this forthcoming uh, Asia Pacific meeting which we are doing in Jaipur. 
Now, uh, this is a very interesting story about it. Now, this is only the second time that uh, Asia Pacific Musculoskeletal Tumor Society meeting is being held in India. The first was in 2002, where Professor Mel Natrajan has done this uh, long back. And uh, after a lot of efforts, we have got this meeting back again. Uh, it has come at the right time because about about four years back, we started IMSOS, that is Indian Musculoskeletal Tumor Society. And now IMSOS is growing with more than 240 uh, members already. And I, uh, we really thought this is the right time that we should get Asia Pacific meeting so that we can showcase what Indian work is all about. And we can invite a lot of people from abroad to visit our country and, and, have, a good, uh, and have a good show. Uh, this was the logo which was created. Uh, again, uh, a short story about it, as you can obviously see, this has the Indian national flag colors embedded into it. You can see the peacock feathers. Peacock is the uh, our uh, national bird, so we incorporated that as well in this. You can see uh, three uh, human beings holding their hands each other, which actually talks about the theme of the meeting, which is the uh, education, collaboration, and innovation. And we we sincerely believe that. If we work together and work on these three factors, we can go ahead and do much better in musculoskeletal oncology. So this meeting will be from 4th to 7th October in Jaipur. And, and uh, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that we will have a fantastic show. And I invite all of you to come and join us. And this meeting actually is a combined meeting of InSource and APMSDS. And we have some wonderful things happening uh, in this meeting. We are especially showcasing the work done by IMSOS members and work done in India. And we have some specific sessions for that. So uh, the, the journey about this meeting started in, uh, where we got this meeting uh, in the uh, two and a half years back when the whole delegation from India had gone to Singapore where the last meeting was being held. And this is one of the rituals which happened with we have to put up uh, a show there and every country which attends the Asia Pacific meeting have to put up a show and this is what we did last time when we got this meeting and invited everybody to come to uh, APMSTS 2018 and we created some special t-shirts as you can see the logo on, uh, on the t-shirts. Uh, and then uh, we decided about where we should do the meeting. We had lots of discussion. We talked about a lot of places in India, like doing it in Delhi, Agra, Goa. But we thought that uh, when we are expecting 250, about 250 people from international arena, we should showcase them the real India. And we thought Jaipur is the right place. And even in Jaipur as well, we went on to the one of the best possible location. And this is a seven-star property, the Hotel Fairmont, where the meeting is going to happen. The, this is a new place which is built like a palace and uh, it's, it's, it's really fantastic to be there and uh, though uh, it will cost a bit more to the, uh, to the organizers uh, but, but I think it will help us to put up a great show and, and give a real royal treatment to our um, guests. So to add some more uh, pictures, so this is the terrace at the eighth floor of uh, the Hotel Fairmont, where we are planning to have the welcome reception for all of you who attend the meeting. This is the ballroom, which is uh, a, a very, very, very classy stuff, and uh, which has a sitting capacity of more than 500 people. And we're going to have a fantastic audio visuals arranged from the, one of the best companies available in India. And we are leaving no stone unturned to put up a great show there. This is one of the picture of the room. Uh, so we have a very attractive residential packages as well. Every room is, is actually like this. And we, we, we went on and we had a great deal with uh, the Vermont people. And we have arranged very attractive packages which are a bit subsidized by the organizers as well. And I hope you come over and stay uh, in, the, in this place and really enjoy uh, the hospitality of the Fairmont. So this is the hotel looks like. This is the poolside area where we are planning to have the gala dinner. And we have, uh, we have a lot of uh, 
local people who will be doing amazing performances. And obviously, the best part about APMSD is that every country who will be coming will be putting up a show. So I'm sure it's going to be a great meeting to attend, and I invite again uh, all of you. So main attractions what we have academically is we're going to have separate IMSOS audition and separate APMST audition, and that's why I said that we we going to give a lot of importance to uh, our IMSOS members as well. Uh, we got more than 420 uh, abstracts, which was a phenomenal response. Uh, though we were we had very strict guidelines and people wanted to submit more, but uh, you know we, we we really got an overwhelming response. The best 65 papers have been selected for podium presentations, and remaining appropriate abstracts were selected for poster presentations. I would like to add here that you know every paper which is is not selected for podium is not the inferior paper, but because we had a limited slot of 65 numbers still we have a lot of good research which is selected in, in in the form of posters so what we have done is that we are creating a separate session a small uh, presentations for again uh, 20 best posters which will be presented and we will have attractive prizes both for podium presentations and for poster presentations as well to add more interaction into the team, we specifically created uh, the case-based interactive sessions, which nowadays are very integral part of uh, oncology sessions. And I'm really proud to say that we were one of the pioneers who started doing that, and I do a lot of moderation in, in, in oncology uh, sessions. Uh, we also wanted the experts the international experts who have a lot of experience to come and share their experience and this is where we included the cases that taught them the most so these people will be talking about the real cases which they have treated over a long period of time and and then has given them a lot of teaching points and they'll be sharing with us we are specifically designing meet the expert sessions and as i mentioned earlier that imsos is not just a surgeon forum we, we always believe in multidisciplinary team and this is where we will have experts from medical oncology, we will have experts from radiation oncology who will be with us to sort out our queries on all the disciplines involved in the management of sarcomas. Specifically for IMSOS members, without any added cost, we are adding pre-conference workshops. We have already planned very attractive navigation workshop, uh, limb reconstruction workshop, a workshop on uh, biopsy and curettage of benign bone lesions. We are also planning to have adjuvant therapy workshop, which will have medical oncology and additional oncology. So all this is very well planned specifically for IMSOS members and Indian delegates for whom these, these workshops will be absolutely free. As an added attraction, we are also taking everybody who register for the conference for a half day Jaipur tour so that we can we, it's, it, it, it's just not the studies we should enjoy the Jaipur uh, hospitality as well. So thank you so much for listening to me. I hope it was useful for to you. I'll be more than happy to answer if there are any questions. Please feel free to give your feedback. Your feedback is going to be very, very essential for us because depending upon your feedback, we can improve in the uh, forthcoming uh, in interactions which we're going to have. Uh, with the help of Dr. Ashok, we have already planned five to six sessions, which will be uh, taken by different speakers, different experts all across the country. And if you need any information regarding uh, Indian Moscow Central Oncology Society or APMSTS meeting, please feel free to contact me on my email ID or on this address. And you can you can tag along with us, and you can uh, follow us, and you can teach to us by Twitter, Facebook, and you can download the app at, from uh, Google Play in maybe from next week onwards. So that's all from here. And uh, Ashok, I'm handing over to you, and I'll be happy to take if we have any questions coming up. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. That was a comprehensive talk about uh, this important topic. Uh, so there are a few questions. Uh, let, let's take the first one. So yeah. if I see a patient of 
suspected bone tumor in my opd what is the sequence of events or sequence that i should follow investigation wise yeah so exactly so uh, thanks to the guy who have asked the question and you know uh, you have actually asked me what i've spoken over last one year uh, one hour you know so the, every slide which you saw here the the right way which you saw here, it it has to be followed it has to start with clinical examination the clinical examination will tell you about what sort of disease you are dealing with whether this this neoplasm looks malignant or this neoplasm looks benign based upon your clinical finding you will order specific investigations now these specific investigations can be divided into hematological investigations and and imaging that's why clinical examination is very important you you just can't abruptly ask for any investigation for any tumor if you are suspecting benign let's for example i'll give you one example let's for example you are looking at giant cell tumor of bone so in giant cell tumor of bone apart from doing your routine blood investigation you will also do alkaline phosphatase which can be a very important differentiating feature from a brown tumor which can differentiate it. you will not ask for very high end imaging to stage the disease you will ask for a local x ray and obviously you will ask for local mri and then you will take it forward how it comes on the other hand if you see a cachexic patient which which looks malignant then obviously you want to plan your staging investigations as well i'm not saying you will do all staging investigation on the first go but definitely you will start planning them and that's how your type of investigations you do will depend upon your clinical examination once you have the imaging once you have the correlation of your clinical and radiological findings based upon that you will plan your biopsy now why imaging is important imaging can give you a lot of clues towards the diagnosis it's extremely helpful imaging can tell you which areas to biopsy now tumors are heterogeneous they may have a lot of necrotic area so you want to target the right areas to have the right yield from the biopsy that's why imaging is so important that's how imaging must be done before doing biopsy once your biopsy is done then depending upon your diagnosis you should take it forward and plan the treatment now in this we we didn't mention about some incidental findings for some tumors which uh, you may say that you i just want to wait and watch like for example you are you you do x ray and patient had a pain in the knee after fall and you do x ray and you find a non ossifying fibroma and you see it on the x ray you see no it, it looks like nof and i don't have to do anything so in this in this case where you are not doing any intervention where you are not doing any treatment you are just observing you may not proceed further with biopsy you may just observe this patient call the patient back, back again on follow up maybe do a serial x ray and try to see the growth of the lesion and then take the reassess and then take a call again what you need to do so that's the right way if a patient comes to you to take for, take it forward right i think uh... you have covered most of the basic points in tumors and since we have further webinars lined up it will be wrong to ask questions related to those so i think uh, we'll take questions as the more webinars come in uh, for this was basic ground work that is being laid out for orthopedic oncology sessions now so based on this on further webinars we'll have more questions and more people interacting meanwhile people can post their questions on the facebook group as a comment to the webinar and uh, dr ashish can answer it there itself so yeah and so again, I, i request everybody to give your feedback and uh, so that we can incorporate them in our uh, future interactions and uh, let us know uh, if you have any queries and i will definitely try to answer that and i will for giving us this platform and opportunity to talk about uh, orthopedic oncology and obviously apms case as well okay so thank you very much sir thanks thank you thanks a lot